parental uh, influence is critical both to supporting mom and what's going on with mom, and then also regulating and co-regulating with the infant. So absolutely great, great question and great call out. So I, I appreciate that. All right, thank you so much, Cody. I know we can get to all of our questions. There's a couple more, but hopefully maybe in the Q&A, we can save those questions for later. Thank you so much. Thank you, it was an honor. All right, Emily, Emily, do you wanna introduce our next speaker? Absolutely. Um, I am really excited to uh, introduce Dr. Kendall German, who I am a little biased. I get to work with on a regular basis over at the University of Washington. Um, Dr. German is a neonatologist. She works at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington. She also um, is one of the physicians that staffs the infant development follow up clinic at the Center on Human Development and Disability, where she is a research affiliate. Her primary area of clinical and research focus is centered on improving neurodevelopmental outcomes of children who have graduated from NICU experiences. Prior to her current position as a physician, she completed her fellowship uh, in neonatal and perinatal medicine and LEND fellowship at the University of Washington. She also completed her residency in pediatrics at the University of California in San Francisco and medical school at the University of California, Davis. We're so lucky to have her as part of our team here. Um, welcome, Dr. German. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Emily. And wow, what an amazing talk and hard act to follow here. I'll go with yes. It looks yes. like it's my two screens, but let me know. <laughs> um, all right. Well, as I say, tough act to follow, but I'll do my best here. Um, uh, thank you all for joining the Duncan seminar this year. I'm really excited to share um, some some information with all of you um, about developmental outcomes in infants who had in utero substance exposure. And um, I hope we'll have a good amount of time for questions at the end, but I'm certainly excited to hear from the rest of the speakers today. So I have uh, no financial conflicts or otherwise. So I wanted to highlight a few uh, learning objectives that I wanted to center around today. The first of which is to summarize the treatments for babies with in utero substance exposure following birth. And um, we'll fo focus mostly on the kind of immediate perinatal period, both because I'm a neonatologist and probably know that the best, and think that um, also that's you know really relevant. That's what starts kids off. And for those of you who are in the kind of newborn period, hopefully that will be of interest. But then also for those um, who interact with children uh, long term, at least may maybe give some context of the type of environment of experiences that these families have gone through in their early days. Um, we'll move on then to discuss the developmental implications of in utero substance exposure based on the available research. And then finally, briefly, um, list the referral services for infants with a history of substance exposure in the um, Washington area. So to start out with a few definitions, the first is the most broad, so in utero substance exposure. That refers to infants whose mothers took substances during pregnancy. These could be prescribed or not. That put them at risk for withdrawal or adverse effects um, after birth. And so this refers to a wide range of medications and supplementations, including opiates, cocaine, methamphetamines, alcohol, and nicotine. Um, some would place SSRIs in that category as well because infants have some kind of withdrawal um, symptoms in the perinatal period um, as well. Um, next is neonatal abstinence syndrome. So getting a little bit more narrow here, this refers to a clinical refers to clinical symptoms that are associated with the abrupt cessation of chronic fetal exposure to a dependent substance. And then finally, neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome is the most narrow that really refers to NAS specifically to opiates. And that's mostly what we're plan I'm planning to focus on today, just to narrow our scope a little bit. So opiate use has a really longstanding history of, of many of you, as many of you may know. So opium use dates back to about 3400 BCE, so a long time ago. And the first surviving records of opium addiction date um, a little bit more recently to the 18th century. Morphine was isolated in 1804 and heroin was synthesized in 1874. Um, so more recent, but were very popular at their time of development. And then the first report of neonatal abstinence syndrome, which was termed congenital morphism at the time, came from uh, the end of the 1800s. 
Then in um, 1903 was the first case report of an infant being treated with morphine for neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and then our long acting opiates that we now use for um, treatment of individuals with chronic opiate use disorder, um, methadone and buprenorphine emerged in 1964 and then uh, 1996 respectively. All right, so as far as scope, so in the US as well as elsewhere in the world, the incidence of opiate use, um, both in the general population as well as use during pregnancy, is increasing, with many now referring to the scope of the problem as the opioid epidemic. A study by the American Academy of Pediatrics demonstrated a five fold increase in the NAS or neonatal abstinence syndrome between 2000 and 2012. And other studies have been shown, have shown up to a tenfold increase over a similar time frame in certain regions. So really on the rise. Although NAS disproportionately impacts certain demographic groups, such as those with lower socioeconomic resources, the increase has really been across all communities, ethnicities, and practice sites. So this is a problem that everyone needs to be familiar with and know how to help, help support. Studies examining the prevalence of in utero substance exposure estimate that between about 1 to 5% of pregnancies are affected by um, opiate use based on studies from 2011 to 2016. Currently, approximately 50 to 80% of all neonates exposed to opioids in utero will develop symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAUS. As far as impact on the healthcare system, it's quite robust. So the mean length of stay is highly variable with considerable site variation. We'll talk a little bit about why that may be. A study in JAMA from 2018 reported a mean length of stay for all NAS babies of about 16 days. And a very large 2021 study um, of NICUs that participate in the neonatal research network called the NICHD showed significant site variability in length of stay with mean length of stays at each site ranging from about two to 29 days, depending on the site. As you might anticipate, infants who require pharmacologic therapy for now typically have longer length of stay. And then survey studies in the US suggest that infants with NAUs who require um, uh, pharmacotherapy typically are cared for in the NICU rather than in, in the general newborn floor. And infants being treated for NAUs may represent a relatively large proportion of all NICU beds, which has a significant um, impact both on cost and also to the family. The mean hospital charge in the United States for an infant with NAUs is about $93,000. Um, and as infants exposed to substances in utero are more likely to receive public insurance rather than private insurance, Medicaid disproportionately covers um, the cost of NAS treatments. So approximately 78% of costs of hospital treatment for NAUs is charged in Medicaid, um, and that represents about $1.2 billion per year. Um, so a lot big societal costs, financial and otherwise. Opioids are a class of both natural and synthetic compounds that act through the active activation of opioid receptors. Um, most commonly, um, the mu receptors. These are located primarily in the central and peripheral nervous system, as well as the GI tract and various other parts of the body. Um, the acute effects of opiates include supraspinal analgesia, which is why they're used in um, things like surgery, uh, sedation, euphoria, meiosis, respiratory depression, and decreased GI motility. And then chronic stimulation of these opiate receptors leads to an increased production of various neurotransmitters through a cascade of enzymatic activities. And this leads to both physical and psychological dependence. As far as thinking about how this affects the fetus, so opiates rapidly cross the placenta um, with drug equilibration between mother and fetus and fetus. So um, the placenta is very susceptible to this movement of drug across a bit. Um, and then the transfer across the placenta increases with increasing gestational age. Um, maternal opiate use during pregnancy has important ramifications um, for both the mother and the fetus or baby. 
So the maternal morbidity and mortality is far higher um, in um, moms who have opiate use disorder than moms that do not. Um, the more maternal morbidity and mortality is about three times higher in mothers who use chronic opiates during pregnancy. And then similarly, the neonatal mortality is also considerably higher um, in babies born to moms with um, uh, an opiate use disorder with a neonatal mortality rate of about 1.12% versus about 0.12%, so a tenfold increase. And that's based on a study out of Canada um, between 2005 and 2016. So really a significant maternal and infant effects. As far as thinking about the fetal effects or teratogenic effects, um, their uh, maternal opiate use during pregnancy increases the rates of preterm birth, low birth weight, and respiratory complications. And those have been fairly well borne out in the literature. Um, other potential teratogenic effects are still um, have been shown in some studies, but have been less clearly defined. And those include the possibility of increased rates of congenital heart disease, hydrocephalus and neural tube defects. Several animal and human studies have suggested an impact of chronic opiate use on brain development in the fetus. So animal studies have shown disruptions in neural migration, decreased length and branching of dendrites in the somatosensory cortex. And then um, opiates have also been shown to induce apoptosis in animal models. This is translated to similar findings in human studies. So, of course, our ability to study that is a little bit different in the human population. Um, but studies of newborns have shown decreased cerebral volumes in infants born to mothers who used heroin during pregnancy, smaller head circumferences in opiate exposed neonates, and deep, uh, disruptions in brain structure based on um, MRI. With the goal of minimizing these adverse effects, um, both on women and infants during pregnancy and after birth, pharmacologic treatment, in, ad in addition to um, probably the more important social supports and behavior therapy interventions, are recommended by really all governing bod bodies um, for pregnant women with chronic opiate use disorder. Um, pharmacologic replacement therapy can be done with either buprenorphine or more commonly methadone. And methadone on the left is a synthetic new receptor um, agonist, similar to other opiates. And it also acts as an antagonist to the excitatory effects of glutamate on the N-methyl D aspartate receptor. So this limits the acute effects of this medication. Buprenorphine is a more recently available alternative to methadone. It's a semi-synthetic partial mu opioid receptor agonist and a complete kappa opioid receptor antagonist. Something um, that's important to remember is that the use of both methadone or um, buprenorphine has been shown to decrease maternal, maternal illicit drug use and improve fetal outcomes, which is great, but it does not decrease the symptoms of NAS and in fact may prolong them. So it's something that we still need to monitor for in the newborn period. Abrupt discontinuation of chronic opiate use when the umbilical cord is cut at birth may lead to withdrawal symptoms in neonates secondary to sudden changes in the balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters that have borne out throughout the pregnancy. So uh, due to the improved transfer of opiates across the blood-brain barrier in newborns as opposed to adults, so adults have a much more um, intact blood-brain barrier that prevents um, various substances, including medications, from crossing that, that barrier is uh, more porous or, or less strong in neonates. Um, also, the half-life of opiates is longer in neonates. And so opiate withdrawal in infants is often worse than in adults. Opiates lead to a uh, decreased release of norepinephrine at synaptic terminals, with the locus ceruleus of the pons being particularly sensitive. And as tolerance develops, the rate of norepinephrine release increases back to closer to normal to accommodate for um, this chronic um, dysregulation. But then that means that abrupt cessation of opioids lead to a big release of norepinephrine, causing the autonomic nervous system signs um, that we commonly associate with nows. Um, and because opioid receptors are concentrated in the CNS and GI tract, 
the predominant signs and symptoms of now reflect this CNS irritability, uh, autonomic re overreactivity, and GI tract dysfunction. So common symptoms include irritability, diarrhea, vomiting, sweating, uh, hyperthermia, hypertension, tremors, tachycardia, and poor sleep. The most severe complication of neonatal abstinence syndrome or withdrawal are seizures, which do occur um, at, at an estimated rate of 2 to 11 percent of infants with NAUs. And that is always the, the fear complication of neonatal abstinence syndrome, though admittedly, um, as someone that cares for infants um, uh, with, uh, with NAUs, I don't see that very often. Risk factors for worse symptoms of NAS include being born term versus preterm, male gender, and um, polysubstance use. And polysubstance use is common, affecting over half of infants with in utero substance exposure. All right, so the onset of symptoms, the frequency of symptoms in exposed infants, and the duration of symptoms depend on the substance. Um, that a child was exposed to in utero with substances having that have longer half-lives, having a later and more prolonged effect. So from a management perspective, this means that infants exposed to long-acting opiates such as methadone and buprenorphine may require longer periods of observation prior to discharge to ensure we're capturing those peak symptoms um, prior to discharge to make sure that we're able to treat infants if needed appropriately. Uh, the window of detection of substances in an infant's urine, blood, and meconium is also highly variable, though meconium testing is the most sensitive um, with a much longer uh, duration of detection from about 20 weeks gestation. So next we'll move on to discuss treatment options for infants affected by NAUs in the newborn period. So I think um, all of us know that the first line intervention for children with neonatal abstinence syndrome should always be focused on non-pharmacologic measures. So non-pharmacologic measures are focused around three main categories um, to minimize dysregulation and maximize infant function. These include modifying the environmental stimulation, feeding practices, and supports for the parent-infant dyad. Uh, so to review some of the evidence-based non-pharmacologic uh, measures that are shown to improve symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome, those include swaddling, so a pretty simple intervention, but that is an evidence-based intervention to help improve symptoms in infants. Breastfeeding, which has been shown to decrease the length of hospital stay and need for pharmacologic treatment by 7 to 44%. Um, so a pretty significant bump there. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, ACOG, which is the governing body, body for obstetricians and lactation agencies now all support breastfeeding for mothers with a history of opiate use disorder who are on a, who are on a stable treatment program at the time of a child's birth. So historically, there's been some concern about um, uh, methadone and buprenorphine at higher doses. Are those safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding? And absolutely, um, there's some transfer of those long-acting opiates in breast milk. The amount is very minimal, um, and the benefits of breastfeeding are far superior. So all of those recommend, all those agencies recommend breastfeeding um, for mothers in an established program. Um, to help improve significantly the outcomes for their infants. Although it's not typically examined in isolation, models that include rooming in between mothers or parents and infants have been shown to lead to decreased need for pharmacologic intervention by about 20 to 60 percent, um, decreased total opioid treatment days, and shortened the length of stay and improved breastfeeding initiation. So, Whenever possible, parents and infants should be kept together, and the parent should be the primary caregiver in the hospital setting, as well as, of course, at home. And then a small study suggests a potential benefit for acupuncture. Although not validated specifically, many non-pharmacologic protocols also recommend the use of um, low-stimulus environments, such as dim lighting, 
on demand feeding, um, avoiding waking sleeping infants, which for any of you who've worked in the NICU with um, infants being treated for NAS, we'll, we'll know that um, those are the rooms that you, you do not want to wake the baby up to do your exam. You will not be popular. Um, kangaroo care, so kind of skin-to-skin -skin care with a parent or caregiver, um, and occasionally music or massage therapy. So moving on to pharmacologic therapy, a recent study by the NICHG found that on average, um, 48.3 or about half um, of all infants with in utero substance exposure receive um, pharmacotherapy for nows. Though they found considerable site to site variation ranging from 7 to 100%. So hard to imagine a wider range there. And while the majority of sites in that study had specific guidelines to which they adhered, there were no uniform, there are no uniform treatment guidelines for now from any of the government governing agencies, which I think is um, the vast, a good a reason for why there's such a vast range of uh, pharmacologic treatments. Survey studies have indicated that morphine is the most commonly used first-line pharmacologic agent for infants with NAUs, though methadone, buprenorphine, clonidine, and phenobarbital are all commonly used for either initial or adjuvant therapies. In order to determine uh, treatment needs and response, validated tools must be used to assess infants in an equitable and objective manner. Most hospitals use a version of what's called the Finnegan Neonatal Abstinence Scoring Tool for evaluation of NAS. And this tool assigns points for symptoms of withdrawal, such as tremors, loose stools, and perineal breakdown. A major challenge with this scoring tool, though, is that the appropriate threshold score for initiation of pharmacologic intervention has not been validated, and some studies have suggested poor internal consistency with this measure. So this may contribute to the significant variability in pharmacologic treatments both um, within and between centers if we don't have good inter-rated reliability and don't even know when um, we should initiate um, additional um, treatments or supports um, based on the Finnegan score. Um, finally, and, and maybe more importantly, um, despite the widespread use of the Finnegan scoring system, the ability for this um, Finnegan score to improve outcomes for infants with NAS has not been assessed. So we all, well, I don't want to say we all, but many centers use this, um, but we don't know whether it really improves outcomes. In 2017, Grossman and his colleagues introduced a treatment approach for infants with NAUs um, published as a quality improvement study in pediatrics. And a lot of centers have um, started adopting this program based on their outcomes. So, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time highlighting it because I'm sure it's something that um, you all have, have not heard about yet will. Um, their proposed um, method was a multi-intervention study that instead of using a numerical score for the assessment of NAS, exclusively evaluated the infant's ability to eat, sleep, and console for determination of need for pharmacologic treatment. Um, and based on this, it's been known as the eat, sleep, console method. So I'll go over a little bit um, of what they found. So they enrolled a generally healthy population of term and near-term infants who were exposed to methadone for at least one month prior to delivery. And they excluded infants with medical comorbidities, so this ended up being a very small number. Uh, they ended up enrolling a total of 287 infants during their overall study window um, and underwent several cycles of PDSA or Plan Do Study Act in order to continue to improve their process. So as with any good QI project, they started with a key driver diagram. They identified average length of stay as their primary outcome measure that they wanted to target. So that's shown in the mid box on the left. So their primary aim was to decrease the average length of stay for infants with NAS by 50% at their center. They also identified both key drivers that they hypothesized um, affected this outcome, and then also um, balancing measures that they wanted to ensure 
um, did worsen with the implementation of their various strategies. So to summarize their interventions, they first prioritize and standardize the non-pharmacologic measures. These included things like decreasing environmental stimuli, engaging families in care, increasing staff education regarding the importance of non-pharmacologic intervention, and prenatal counseling of patients um, to describe the importance of their um, involvement in the child's care after birth. So I think that kind of last point is somewhat unique at many different centers. Um, and um, I was really kind of excited that they started to incorporate families even before a child was born. They eliminated the use of the Finnegan scoring system altogether. And as I mentioned, instead focused exclusively on three key assessments, whether the child could eat a minimum of one ounce per feed or breastfeed successfully, sleep for a period of at least one hour at a time, and third, be consoled within 10 minutes. Um, finally, they also changed their pharmacologic interventions, allowing spot dosing of morphine rather than scheduled dosing and increasing the rate of um, morphine weans if possible. So commonly, um, if infants are having uh, significant symptoms of now and the provider thinks they need pharmacologic intervention, a child would be started on a um, scheduled dose of morphine that they would receive typically every three to four hours, um, which they would then need to wean off of. But the um, study leaders found that oftentimes the child's symptoms would kind of wax and wane during the day and they didn't want to um, commit the child to having to be on this long-standing course as they felt like they only needed spot dosing. Sorry, I just have an alert to come up. I'll just make sure in case you all see that. So here are their results, which are admittedly quite impressive. So for their primary outcome measure, the average length of stay, they showed a significant decrease with average length of stay decreasing from about 22 and a half to 5.99 days. Um, in terms of secondary outcomes that they also measured, um, they found that the use of morphine decreased from 98 to 14% of all infants and hospital costs decreased from nearly $45,000 to approximately $10,000 per infant. As far as balancing measures, they found that no infants in the study had any seizures and none were readmitted to the hospital for NAS within 30 days. So all very significant findings, which, um, um, are promising. This is their control chart for the length of stay based on their various PDSA cycles. So the length of stay is listed on the y-axis and then um, the admit date um, over time is listed across the x-axis and then each arrow indicates an intervention from their PDSA cycle. So you can see a nice downtrend in the length of stay with a significant change in the baseline attributable to special cause variation. So for those of you familiar or not familiar with QI or research strategies, there are various different kind of rules for how to determine whether a change in the baseline is related to a true change or what we call special cause variation. So their intervention in this case versus normal fluctuation in the baseline, which would, one would anticipate due to random chance, and they found a significant attributable change. Um, next, we see the um, treatment with morphine, and we again see a nice decrease in morphine use over time with the various interventions. And so based on the strong results of the study, as I said, many centers have moved to adopting the Eat Sleep Console method as their primary management strategy for instance, with, um, with NOWS. And while the results are, as I said, very impressive, we must also acknowledge the ongoing gaps in our knowledge of this treatment strategy. So namely, um, we don't yet have any outcome data for this intervention strategy to know whether it improves or at least does not worsen developmental outcomes in kind of the short and long-term of infants who were treated with this strategy versus historical um, treatment strategies. Um, luckily, I do know the authors are planning such a strategy, um, though, uh, to my knowledge, it hasn't been published yet. So we're all anxiously awaiting that. 
Um, also, I think it's important to remember that this is a, was a single center study and several features of their pre-implementation plan and patient population may positively bias these results. So um, all of their infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome were initially admitted to the NICU prior to their interventions. Um, all, of, all of them who had in utero substance exposure, even if they didn't require treatment. Um, we know that admission to the NICU where families also often cannot be at the bedside, um, it's a very high stress and high stimulating environment is associated with higher morphine use. So likely they started out with a population who had a very high, um, high rate of morphine or um, pharmacotherapy need. Um, and they, and that, that was shown in them having a particularly high rate of morphine use prior to initiation of this QI, QI excuse me, intervention. They also had um, a relatively low incidence of polypharmacy in their population at about 30%, which is below most other centers. Um, and as we mentioned previously, polypharmacy is associated with a higher rate of NAS symptoms. So I feel like they did have a, a kind of a, the perfect storm, so to speak, to really show an improvement in their numbers. Not that their numbers aren't impressive, but could that have led to um, stronger findings than when we might expect at some other centers. So moving on to our next learning goal, um, to evaluate the impacts of in utero substance exposure on neurodevelopmental outcomes. So in addition to the effects on fetal and newborn outcomes that we discussed previously, such as low birth weight, higher mortality, and increased respiratory needs, there are also differences observable in infants with in utero substance exposure, including a higher rate of SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome being reported in um, infants exposed to in utero substance substances during pregnancy or the fetal life, and then also decreased quiet sleep beyond the immediate newborn period. In terms of longer term outcomes for infants, infants exposed to opiates in utero have higher rates of rehospitalization, lower elementary school grades, higher rates of some mental health conditions such as behavioral disorders. Um, and then um, long-term effects on development. So Lee et al. completed a systematic review and meta-analysis of opiate-exposed infants who, that was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, or in the Journal Pediatrics, excuse me. Um, they're slightly different journals in 2020, so fairly recently. So I wanted to summarize their findings since it's probably one of the, the best meta-analyses that's uh, contemporary. They showed significantly lower performances in a variety of developmental domains, including, um, as highlighted here, cognition and psychomotor development. Um, so as you can see, the, the summary data in the, uh, in the diamond for both cognition on the top and psych psychomotor um, scores on the bottom is to the left of the um, competence line. Um, they also show lower cognitive scores, expressive and receptive language. Externalizing behaviors are an area that seems to be particularly re relevant to infants exposed to opiates in utero. Um, so Nigard et al. Um, described the disruptions in the four A's in infants with a history of substance exposure. They described um, disruptions in arousal, attention, affect, and action, and found that the disruptions in these domains lead to challenges with self-regulation, executive function, and attention. Um, and certainly, while these attention and ex or, uh, and attention, um, excuse me, and externalizing symptoms do seem to predominate, as you can see here again from Lee et al. Um, children with a history of substance exposure do also have increased rates of internalizing or self-regulation problems, such as anxiety and depression. So we think mostly of, of attention challenges and externalizing behaviors in this population, but don't want to forget the internalizing behaviors and mood disorders that also disproportionately affect this population. 
But when we talk about developmental outcome studies in children with in utero sudden exposure, I do think it's important to think about the context of these studies and the significant potential for confounders that may be contributing to the outcomes we see, um, as we, we, we kind of touched on in the last talk. So children born, born to opioid mothers with chronic opiate use disorder are also at risk for exposure to postnatal psychosocial um, challenges such as poverty, caregiver mental health concerns, um, disrupted parenting, and all of these are known to increase the risk of long-term disruptions in neurodevelopment. So is this a chicken or the egg question? Some studies do try to account for this with case control studies using pretty good comparator groups, such as infants who are in households um, with substance use, but where it is not the mom that used the substance and therefore infants don't have um, in utero substance exposure. Um, or studies, some studies also examine infants um, with substance use exposure in utero who then um, are either in the foster care system or have been adopted and are no longer um, in a, uh, exposed to ongoing substance use in the household. Though, of course, um, foster, um, foster care and adoption do have other kind of stress ramifications. These studies still report, um, those with kind of a good case control, um, do still report differences in outcomes in infants exposed versus not exposed to opiates in utero, but the differences are often smaller. Um, in a longitudinal study, they did find that these long-term behavioral problems were mitigated over time by protective factors, such as positive home environment, uh, um, such the, that the effect of prenatal drug exposure on behavior problem scores was mitigated by the presence of protective or resiliency factors. So that really highlights the importance of, of providing as much support we can, we can to these families to mitigate any potential um, behavioral effects. And this is something we, you know, that was talked about in the last talk a little bit, but um, the importance of fetal programming in the brain. So I think few of us would argue that women with substance um, dependent experience, that with substance use, um, have experienced significantly more psychosocial stress than those without. And um, the effects of prenatal stress have been shown to many, to, to lead to many symptoms um, in infants. Um, that mirror now. So things like affective disorder, irritability, anxiety, preterm birth, low birth weight, psychological conditions, increased reactivity um, in both human and animal studies have been seen to um, have been seen in infants exposed to chronic stress, stress in utero. Um, and so the social environment in utero may play a critical role in the elevated stress response in the mother and fetus. Taking us this a step further, mothers with substance use disorder are themselves more likely to have experienced adverse childhood events and other adverse effects leading to chronic stress and potential impacts on their own children. So this multiple, multiple generation hypothesis is commonly termed the life course perspective of disease and is likely at least contributing to the impacts that we see um, on this population. Uh, finally, I wanted to touch on our third learning objective, which is to identify the developmental support services available to infants with a history of in utero substance exposure. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with early intervention, but it's a mainstay for developmental screening and intervention for children less than three years old who are at risk for developmental differences. It's a program that's federally mandated, but run on the state level and then early individual early intervention centers are specific to a child's uh, county of residence. Due to the potential developmental risks associated with prenatal OP exposure, in utero substance exposure automatically qualifies an infant at least for a developmental assessment by birth to three. So for all of you providers out there, I would strongly encourage you to refer all of your infants um, with a history of even exposure, even without need for pharmacologic therapy, et cetera, at least for an evaluation. When thinking about our success with getting at-risk infants uh, assessed by early intervention, a study published in the Journal of Development 
developmental and behavioral pediatrics in 2019 showed that about 77% of all infants with in utero uh, opiate exposure were referred to EI. Um, the number was higher in infants who were discharged to their biological parents than those who were discharged home to foster families. And despite this fairly high referral rate of 77%, only 48% of infants ultimately received an assessment, um, suggesting that there's a breakdown in communication between the referral and the actual assessment. So again, for those of you who care for infants with in utero opiate exposure, please um, follow up with families regarding early intervention um, and share with them the importance of that assessment and help, help them navigate the system as far as getting their child assessed. Early Head Start is a child and family support program for low-income families with children less than three years old and pregnant women and is another uh, potential opportunity for this population. And then resources specific to the Seattle um, uh, area include the Hope Rising Program, Wonderland, Child and Family Services, um, the University of Washington Infant Development Follow-Up Program, where my, myself and Emily work. Um, we also see um, children with in utero substance exposure. So for any child um, who lives in the area with a history of in utero um, opiate exposure, please refer them to the Infant Development Follow-Up Program any pediatrician or care provider can refer them. And we see infants for standardized developmental care assessments starting at three years old and uh, continuing on until school age. There's also the University of Washington Center for Adoption Medicine and the Foster Care Clinic. So to, to summarize, just to wrap up a little bit, um, our discussion today, our first learning objective was to summarize treatment for now. And uh, excuse me talking for too long here. And this includes both non-pharmacologic and potentially pharmacologic intervention treatments with an important emphasis on non-pharmacologic measures. Eat Sleep Console is a new treatment approach that has become popular based on reported reduced length of stay, hospital cost, and morphine use, though long-term effects of the strategy have not yet been evaluated. We then discussed the developmental implications of in utero substance exposure and several animal and human studies suggest a potential impact on brain development and long-term outcomes. <coughs> Excuse me, but socioeconomic and other sources of stress may confound these results. And it's important to uh, emphasize the protective factors that may mitigate these outcomes. Finally, we reviewed the resources for families affected by in utero substance exposure, including early intervention and um, birth to three, early head start, and uh, local support services. So thank you. I have a few slides of resources for anyone that is interested. Thank you so much, Dr. Herman. That was wonderful. Thank you. Let me share the screen with the Q and A. Really quickly before uh, before we answer some Q and A um, questions, because I know there will be plenty. Um, I wanted to briefly acknowledge um, the diversity that is who a parent is, and sometimes we yeah. get stuck in convention. Um, yeah. And so I wanted to briefly discuss and acknowledge that what who is a parent can take all shapes and sizes. And so uh, moving forward, we will work on using gestational parent um, as a more inclusive term um, and, and caregiver as well. So thanks all for that feedback and we're all continuing to learn. So thank you. All right, everyone, I have the QR code up again and there's also a link in the chat box Please copy and paste that link into a browser. Um, I think that tends to work best. So I'll give it another couple of seconds or so. And this is our first question, Great. Dr. Turman. Thanks so much. So yes, our first question has to do with whether with uh, what withdrawal symptoms of SSRIs may look like in uh, neonates. Um, and yes, SSRIs can lead to um, what is hypothesized to be withdrawal sy symptoms, though some people describe um, it as perhaps uh, kind of a response to the medication and 
of itself. These symptoms can mirror um, NAUs or opiate withdrawal, but to typically a lesser degree. So these infants can be irritable, have a higher pitched cry, have some challenges with cons consoling, um, et cetera, um, that can last for a period of several days to a couple of weeks. So like there's another question. question in there. Yeah, there we go. Um, perfect. Are there permanent changes in brain that show up on imaging, frontal lobe, et cetera? Yes. So there is, um, as I mentioned, both kind of animal studies and human studies. Um, animal studies, um, since we're able to do kind of a little bit more molecular testing and, and, and look at the brain in further detail, there's there's differences in the structure of brains, including kind of dendrogenesis, synaptogenesis in that population. And then what we've seen on MRI or functional MRI studies, um, specifically DTI, is that there are um, kind of changes in those white matter tracks um, seen in individuals uh, who were exposed to substances in utero. Yeah, is care always provided in the NICU or are there specialized centers providing this care as well? So historically, um, much of this care was received in the NICU for infants with in utero substance exposure. Um, I think the reason for that was that there was such a concern that these infants would be at risk either for seizures, um, which we do see though at a low rate, or for um, respiratory depression in the setting of initiation of pharmacotherapy with morphine. Um, luckily, we have learned that the rates of those are very small, but the benefit associated with keeping um, a gestational parent or, or kind of any caregiver um, with the child um, is far far more impactful than um, the need for this neuromonitoring. So there is has been a shift towards keeping these children um, with caregivers, um, it, including in the newborn period. And this could be done either on the kind of uh, general nursery floor or commonly on the pediatrics floor. And some centers have actually set up a kind of a specialized area that these children are able to be with their families in. There's another question that came in. I'm not sure if this is a statement of a question, but it says, okay. why are FASDs under or fail to diagnose even at Children's or UW when the CDC says the conservative estimate is to be one in 20 have FASD, more than autism, Downs, and CP combined? I, I'm, I'm not sure I have too much to add to that. I, I, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but if someone wants to. But I agree, we, we do not do, do a very good job of saying this. And perhaps whoever submitted that question could just put that in the chat. Sorry for that. Um, and then I see the next question, is there any even research that shows how fentanyl affects now? So um, yes, so fentanyl we are seeing um, more use of more recently in the past few years. Um, it, similar to any other opiate, um, will lead to a um, symptoms of withdrawal or has the potential to in infants exposed to that in, uh, in utero. Fentanyl has a very short half-life in comparison with many other opiates. So the good and the bad news with fentanyl is that if you're going to have symptoms, um, your symptoms tend to be earlier on um, in comparison with, for example, methadone or buprenorphine where your symptoms may be several days out. Um, but it certainly can lead to a similar picture. Um, are the opiates that are used today stronger or worse than they were 10 to 20 years ago? Um, good question. I'm actually, I, I think there's been a shift in use of opiates and towards um, some shorter acting ones like fentanyl. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head what the kind of average dose is now than it, it, versus previously. So I'm not sure that I can speak to that. The frequency of use has certainly increased with um, larger percentage of individuals um, having uh, exposure to opiates. 
um, um, many of them, which are prescribed, frankly, I think is where been a, a lot of the shift has been. Are there any resources or research that we'd recommend regarding prenatal methamphetamine? I'm assuming meth, you mean methamphetamine exposure. Um, great question. I'm less familiar with this literature, admittedly. Um, methamphetamine exposure is in the category of needle needle abstinence syndrome. Um, not now, since it's not an opiate, but um, certainly can be associated with, with some withdrawal symptoms. Um, there's less literature on the long-term implications of, the, of um, that uh, drug on on long-term outcomes, but some emerging literature um, uh, about potential implications there. I, personally, I feel like one of the challenges with research in that area is um, polypharmacy or polysubstance use with methamphetamines is quite common, which makes it a little bit more challenging to kind of pinpoint um, the effects of methamphetamines versus um, the other uh, medications or substances that are used as pregnancy. Yeah, fentanyl. Um, is there a relationship between timing of opiate exposure during gestation and symptoms or severity? So great question. And there does appear to be one. So infants who have exposure um, later in pregnancy and, and infants who are born later in pregnancy tend to have worse symptoms. So um, if you were born preterm, your symptoms of neonatal um, abstinence syndrome tend to be less severe than if you were born full term. There's a few hypothesized reasons for that. One is if you were born full term versus preterm, you were probably exposed to opiates for a longer period of time. If mom um, or excuse me, or the gestational parent was taking those substances throughout the pregnancy. So just kind of a chronicity as far as your dependent, uh, the baby's dependence or kind of disruptions in their um, uh, their neurotransmitters, et cetera. Also term babies have a higher fat percentage than um, preterm babies. So thought that, that they could accumulate more substances. Um, also just kind of the, the neural behavior of preterm infants versus term infants is different. And uh, scoring systems like the Finnegan scoring that look at um, um, the symptoms of neonatal abstinence syndrome were really developed for term and preterm or term and near term infants. So it's also possible that we're just under recognizing what now's um, looks like in a preterm infant. So that could be part of it as well. But in general, um, later exposure and um, uh, term birth is associated with worse symptoms. Um, any updated information? Yes, on the de um, developmental impacts of marijuana exposure in utero. Um, especially in light of legalization of marijuana in, in several states. A great question and a topic of that's coming up as far as research, because now, now that it is legal, I think many women are more, or excuse me, many, many individuals are more likely to endorse use of marijuana during pregnancy. Um, and I, we're seeing more use of isolated marijuana uh, use during pregnancy rather than um, uh, polypharmacy. So emerging literature, but I don't feel like I have a good understanding yet of the developmental impacts of isolated marijuana exposure, um, but either, either during pregnancy or also breastfeeding because um, marijuana um, or THC is expressed in breast milk as well. So infants can be exposed in that, in that way also. There's a comment from Sophia in the chat. She asked a question regarding uh, the FASD diagnosis. Oh, great. Um, it's, be it's best because these kids are born with developmental disabilities and because only one in 10 kids have physical indicators. Yeah, ninety percent of these kids are not diagnosed at all, or are not diagnosed mm -hmm. until they're teens, and diagnosed by age six is best. So interventions can occur. And despite known, I'm not sure what PAE stands for, the fact that our child looks normal resulted in children's new dub telling us our child could not have that uh, condition, um, but does I have severe permanent yeah. damage. I yes, I completely agree. It can be. Um, a huge frustration to families because there a lot of times we have very narrow definitions of what different diagnoses look like um, and not every child 
I was going to fit into those narrow definitions. And so being a little bit more flexible, I think, with our um, understanding of, of, um, of kind of various different presentations would be helpful. Um, and then the next question was whether there's a recommendation for a standardized assessment that is sensitive enough to provide data that can be used to better serve nows newborn infants within the community level. Great question. I'm not familiar with any um, standardized assessments that's specific to nows that um, uh, is is kind of is easily done um, outside of a, a, a kind of a standardized assessment tool. Um, if any point, what, and what, if anyone is, please put it in the chat. But. Yeah, great. So my previous understanding was that alcohol was the only known teratogen, but if opioids lead to microcephaly and decrease to growth, would you consider opioids a teratogen also? Yeah, great question. You're absolutely right that the um, the teratogenic effects of alcohol have been clearly established. Um, however, we are learning more about opiates and how these may affect development um, from from kind of early in fetal life. And so, yes, I agree that um, opiates, it looks like may end up being um, neonatoratogen now that we can kind of understand their impact. Oh, great question. What differences in the brain do you see between drug exposure versus alcohol exposure? So I'm less familiar with um, fetal alcohol syndrome to tell you the truth as, as far as the specific brain complications. So I know some of our speakers are, are experts in this can speak to this more um, more thoughtfully than I can. Um, both are associated um, with microcephaly and structural changes. Um, uh, certainly the kind of the, the receptors that are affected with opiate use uh, differences um, as far as the opiate receptor being affected and therefore kind of differences in norepinephrine, et cetera, are going to be separate, um, but both can lead to kind of low, low brain volumes and that sort of thing, though um, FASD is more clearly defined in that regard. And then is the Eat Sleep Console treatment model currently widely accepted and used as primary intervention model? So it is certainly widely accepted and used. At the, um, for example, the AAP has not yet um, identified that or frankly any treatment strategy as the way to go for individuals with in utero substance exposure. So, Part of the challenge and part of the reason I think that we have such significant variability in um, how treatment uh, treatment is uh, given at different centers has to do with the lack of guidance from governing agencies about this is kind of the exact protocol you should follow and et, et cetera. We don't have the evidence to support one particular strategy yet, though there is evidence that just having a guideline at, a, at your institution has improved outcomes. So. Um, Eat Sleep Console is, is not really considered the gold standard, though I will say that many, many centers are starting to adopt this. I'm not sure if it's the majority yet, um, but quite a few. Uh, what are the comparative incidents and prevalence of prenatal exposure to opiates versus alcohol and relative long-term outcomes for those exposures? So um, alcohol exposure continues to be higher than opiates. Um, opiates, as I say, mentioned around one to 5%. I'm not sure what alcohol is, is a top, um, off the top of my head, but it's higher. Um, and the developmental impacts of um, high alcohol exposure um, are, are more severe than opiate exposure. Um, though the manifestation, manifestation of these is a little bit different, so may not be as apparent in the newborn or neonatal period, but rather have uh, longer term implications, um, more significant than the opiates. Um, I think what's most concerning about the opioids is the rate of increases really skyrocketed. And then are these services and 
resources available to individuals outside of King County um, services. Yeah. So yes, so the services, for example, infant development follow-up clinic, uh, we see many families outside of King County. Um, the only limitation, frankly, is the family's ability to, to get to that center since if they live you know, at a distance, that can be a challenge for, from, to commute there. But yeah, we absolutely think, see kids outside of King County. Um, things like birth to three or early intervention um, is, will be administered at each child's county. So you just have to go to the right center, but, each county has a birth to three provider. And non pharmacologic in intervention is there typically a need for swaddle and low stimuli after the newborn period? Great question. There, there's a lot of controversy about how long these symptoms truly persist. So, um, for uh, particularly for long acting opioids, you may see symptoms for. Um, several days, potentially weeks. Um, there's less, there's not a lot of evidence for how long these interventions are beneficial, but certainly that, that some of the neurologic symptoms can persist for a long period of time. Um, and I think it's worthwhile for families or caregivers to, to kind of assess their infant and, and see what is beneficial to their child. Um, Cause it's hard to argue that most of those non-pharmacologic non interventions are detrimental. And then this question is really um, specific to Seattle Children's, but I think it might be applicable across different institutions with staffing shortages yeah. and how do healthcare professionals best support um, these infants when, you know, you're dealing with staffing um, shortage? Yes, that is a big challenge is that, um, you know, as I mentioned, the ideal environment for um, children um, experiencing now is, is to have a care provider really with them 24 seven. The way some centers have addressed this is um, as ability to have volunteers and that sort of thing. If the caregiver is not themselves able to be at the be bedside, um, though in the if situations of COVID where limitations are being placed on volunteer um, availability and, and, and access, that may not be an option, but that's something that historically has been, has been used to kind of bridge that gap. All right, well, thank you so much for your talk.